Hi, I'm Allison Hazel here for I Care to Inspire, and I'm here with artist Terry Dixon. How you doing? <laughs> Thank you for coming. No problem. Um, I want to talk to you a little. I know you're originally from Chicago. No, no, Washington D.C. Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, born and raised. Yeah, but um, uh, moved around by going to college at Atlanta College of Art. Okay. But that was um, wow. in the, uh, about 1987, wow. and um, from 1987, um, finishing undergraduate art school, uh, I eventually um, moved on to Chicago to graduate school okay. at the School of the Art Institute. Okay, so you so, yeah, so yeah, so I basically bounced around from Chicago um, back to Atlanta, and then wound up back in Chicago um, in 1999, um, teaching uh, at at a um, at a college in the Chicago area. Okay, mm -hmm. and I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about. You know, this is sitting here today. Um, I noticed that each piece kind of tells a story about different times in history mm -hmm. um, by African Americans. So, what inspired you to do, you know, your pieces and all that? Um, well, the show encompasses a wide variety of um, of work. So, we can uh, start with uh, what I've been doing for quite some time is the urban photography pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so, are also called urban portrait pieces. So with the urban portrait pieces, I always have a connection with uh, with just the uh, uh, social uh, situations um, and people in general. Uh, so a lot of times when I'm out in the street, I do I photograph people and I, and I interact with their life stories. Uh, and so we have like a piece called One Woman's Story. We have a piece called Will I See You Again. Um, we have a piece called Staring Off. And within some of these pieces. Uh, I'm able to interact with them, talk to them about their lives, understand what they're currently doing, how they got into those situations, and then either name the piece uh, from what they may have said to me the last part of the conversation. So the piece titled Will I See You Again, uh, after learning about his uh, story, uh, I took the, the last thing he said to me and gave her that title of the piece. Um, one woman's story, her and her husband were actually homeless. And uh, I took her small part of her life story and wrote that information on top of the canvas. And um, one thing uh, that winds up happening as well is you've captured their point in time in their lives and they're immortalized on, on the canvas. So there's a lot of interaction that I do with, uh, with mouths, eyes, and the whole part of the face because the face is a form of communication. And I think um, the face is a portal into one's soul in their life, because the face is all communication. And the life stories are told on the face. Okay. So um, if you ever met somebody who has lived in the street, their face looks very harsh, and the stress of life and things that they've gone through, uh, the face uh, doesn't lie. You know, it, it tells uh, truly one strong aspect of who that person could, could truly be, you know what I mean? And you mentioned that you take like actual photographs. And I've noticed with some of your pieces, there it's a mix of like photography, I guess a little bit of digital art, actual studio mm -hmm. art. So how do you blend like all of that together? Um, well, my background first traditionally was in photography okay. uh, when I was in undergraduate art school, and even before I got even, even got into college, uh, some time back, um, uh, my father uh, put me in the dark room and taught me how to develop pictures. So we talked about film photography. You know, this is back, probably back in. Um, uh, the late 70s. Uh, so um, by the time probably maybe 1980, 81, uh, I was uh, put into a darkness situation. So you know, I'm here, you know, 13 years old, 12 years old, and I'm already learning how to work uh, in the dark room with, with, in the dark, rolling film up onto the, the film spool and putting it in the development tank and printing the actual images. So. Um, he trained me how to uh, to do a lot of photography work, and um, and as technology changed, you, I went from film to digital photography. And um, uh, when I wound up getting into undergraduate art school, I went as a photo major. Um, the whole thing about me getting involved with digital imagery was I was so upset that I couldn't get into a, a film uh, film photography class that I had the only option of getting into a computer class. And at that point in time. Computers were very different back then because it was all mainly DOS and programming. Mm -hmm. So I was just frightened about that because I didn't want to get involved in that boring aspect of um, uh, just using code to, to create anything. 
So um, I had been introduced to a platform called the Commodore Amiga, and that system already came out of the box with um, capabilities of doing audio, video. We're talking still very, very mid-80s, and um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, independent development uh, software uh, by other people created programs for the computer, and that uh, those um, some of the programs were, were digital paint programs, very early crude digital paint programs, but I was able to, to digitally start to paint and create. And it may have been, you know, very low tech, but that was, back then that was in. That was technology back then. And um, I found out that I could actually scan my photo into the computer. And then at that point in time, there were no flatbed scanners. There was actually um, uh, just black and white, uh, 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 like regular security cameras that are put on a on a stand, and you would turn a color wheel. Uh, so you so RGB the colors uh, RGB for video. Yeah. Red, green, and blue. You had to actually turn. You had to scan in one pass of red, one pass of green, and one pass of blue. And then you had to put the color gel over top of the camera to scan in the actual image. Uh, so um, that was my introduction into early digital technology in the, uh, the mid to late 80s. And uh, then, you know, as, as time moved on, 90s, 2000s, um, you know, the digital camera, uh, digital, uh, the, the digital SLR camera uh, became more prevalent, and printers and, and technology, and, and my own uh, um, uh, learning and, and experimenting with different technologies allowed for me to make this merger between uh, traditional studio art practices and the digital world. Um, so a lot of trial and error came into play to get this to manifest as something that I could I could call my own. Yeah. That's really interesting, the evolution of yeah. <laughs> yeah. how that works. It takes time. <laughs> and I noticed with your pieces, um, it's kind of like a cloth mm -hmm. material and then the mesh material, so it was symbolic. Um, now those are basically uh, uh, something that, that I use for uh, visual aesthetic purposes and in that way I use it to uh, juxtapose against some of the photos mm -hmm. but then they are <coughs> symbolically used um, for this re-enslavement topic that I was working on. I worked on the topic of re-enslavement of African Americans uh, from 2008 to about 2011 mm -hmm. and that whole um, a topic that I was working on uh, was a, a topic that uh, worked with uh, pastimes and, and culture, and what I what I wanted to do within using different materials is to kind of show that rustic worn effect uh, with a lot of those particular pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so this one here called sharecroppers, I used uh, um, linen to build the house structure. So because the linen has those earth tones, mm -hmm. I want to use that within the house structure. And then I wanted to use the linen to also build the, uh, the person's body and to relate to skin texture. Um, so a lot of those are some, some of those techniques I use are symbolic in the, in the creations of those structures. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned that it takes you a lot of longer pieces of it. Yeah, um, at one point in time I was uh, uh, working on uh, work for um, a gallery that I was working with. And, and some of the <coughs> demands were to have a piece created within 30 days. Um, but sometimes I've worked on a piece uh, that I have titled Less Than Fully Human. Uh, I worked on that piece for about a year because I would come back to it and stop and come back and work on ideas and work on different type of techniques on how to make that piece totally come together. Um, so it all depends on, um, on uh, what I have in demand for different shows. It depends. That also goes into the fact of how long it's the trade works. I think a lot of people don't really understand the process of yeah. how a piece comes together. Like, does the thought come in your head, or do you have to go to a stop, or...? Well, a lot of times you have to walk away from a piece and then come back. Um, because you want to be able um, to let your mind breathe sometimes. Uh, sometimes you can overkill a piece by thinking about it too much. Um, a lot of times, uh, well, a lot of questions I've received uh, during the week, um, with different people uh, talking to me uh, during the gallery opening, um, people ask me, you know, um, how long did it take to finish a piece and what inspires you and 
and so forth. And a lot of times you have to just walk away, come back, work on another piece at the same time you're working on that piece. Um, so um, uh, I get inspired by also different topics in society or um, other ongoing um, thought process of when I'm working on my urban portrait uh, pieces. Um, so it can be a topic that I think about, uh, something that's come across in society that sparks me to create a body of work. Um, so it's made to the facets, facets that go into creating. Uh, one of the big aspects of me working and creating work is my inspiration of creating with um, listening to electronic music, listening to jazz music. Those are some of the kind of backbones and underlying inspirations of, of creating a lot of the line work that goes into the actual pieces. Do um, other artists inspire you as well? Or I have other artists that have inspired me. I think every artist is inspired by other artists. Um, a lot of people have uh, quoted um, many different artists. They say that uh, my work has a strong influence from. And, um, you know, we have Jacob Lawrence, Romare Bearden, you have uh, Jean Michel Bescat, you have uh, Keith Haring. I mean, those are just naming a few out of the pocket. Um, uh, I mean, uh, the list can kind of go, kind of go on. Uh, people that um, I've uh, um, heard that my work is uh, uh, kind of inspired by or has somewhat of a value <coughs> to it. Okay, and lastly, like, do you want your pieces to strictly be seen as like gallery pieces or someone says, I love this piece, I, I want it? It's, it's for everybody, private collectors, <laughs> museums, um, institutions. Uh, I'm fortunate to have my work in a private collection at the David C. Driscoll Center. Um, that was a piece titled Reenslavement. That was a very large uh, 73 by 73 inch piece um, that basically has a lot of me in it. My, my name is, uh, is broken down into the initials and birth date uh, written into the piece. Um, uh, I was just talking earlier about the reenslavement, a topic that I worked on for, for three years. Name. My last name is Dixon. Um, uh, when I drive from Chicago to the East Coast, uh, when I go through the Maryland route, I pass over the Mason-Dixon line. So in my family, we have a last name of Mason. And, and my father's side of family is the last name of Dixon. So you can kind of really go right there and see, you know, we were owned, we're descendants of, of slaves, of slave owners. You know, so um, uh, that last name that we carry uh, has the European hi history behind it. And um, we're doing my research and history of learning about uh, the re-enslavement of African Americans working on a three-year body of work. I um, ran across the story of a corrupt sheriff with the last name Dixon. So I said, I'm related to him because I have that last name. It's no way of escaping it. You know what I mean? And once you have that last name of anybody you bump into, if you bump into a last name of somebody who's Williams, you are part of a Williams line. It's, it's just that interesting. Um, so, within that particular piece, I, I decided to put myself into that piece. And uh, that's a very long, elongated individual who was dressed in um, prison clothes. Um, and uh, um, that's an incredible collection. Thank you so much for coming. No yeah, problem. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's beautiful. It. Thank you. Thank you.